Hello, and welcome to the National Archives Foundation's virtual program series. I'm Patrick Madden, the Executive Director of the National Archives Foundation, and thanks for joining us at home today. Through this programming, we are opening the doors of the National Archives, its holdings and collections, to share the treasures that are yours, the American people, through these spirited conversations. No doubt by now you're receiving our American Experience emails on Tuesdays, or for our young historian and followers, uh, we've got History Snacks on Fridays for kids and families. If not, you can sign up on our website, archivesfoundation.org. And of course, it's not lost on us that the holiday season is around the corner. So we hope you'll uh, pay us a virtual visit to our archive store, nationalarchivestore.org for all of your gift needs. Um, so this uh, today, we've got a terrific lineup of guest speakers. They will be taking questions uh, later in the program. So we wanna make sure that you are prepared to ask your questions. So um, if you can, on the side of your YouTube screen, you'll see the chat box. Uh, so, so you get a little practice in here. Uh, why don't you send us your hometown and state? I'll give you a shout out later on. And that's where you can put your questions in uh, throughout the program. You don't need to wait until the Q&A section. If you have questions as our speakers are talking, we're happy to, uh, to take those questions early. So uh, let us know where, where you're watching from today. Before we begin, I wanna thank the Ford Motor Company for their support of this program and for supporting our presentation of the featured documents display this year commemorating the end of World War II. I encourage you to take a look at those documents on our website, archivesfoundation.org. If you're tuning in today, you have an idea of how this program will unfold. We have three terrific perspectives on the arsenal of democracy, a term coined by FDR calling for American businesses to expand war production and help the government in the war effort. Uh, earlier this year, uh, in the current healthcare crisis, again, businesses were called uh, to help the nation. So let's listen uh, to FDR's fireside chat from December 29th, 1940. Note that's a year before uh, we were in the war. Here's FDR. My friends, this is not a fireside chat on war. It is a talk on national security. Because the nub of the whole purpose of your president is to keep you now and your children later and your grandchildren much later out of a last ditch war for the preservation of American independence and all of the things that American independence means to you and to me and to ours. American industrial genius, unmatched throughout all the world in the solution of production problems, has been called upon to bring its resources and its talents into action. Manufacturers of watches, of farm implements, of linotypes and cash registers and automobiles and sewing machines and lawn mowers and locomotives are now making fuses and bomb packing crates and telescope mounts and shells and pistols and tanks. We must be the great arsenal of democracy for us this is an emergency as serious as war itself. We must apply ourselves to our task with the same resolution, the same sense of urgency, the same spirit of patriotism and sacrifice as we would show were we at war. So again, that's December 29th, 1940. That fireside chat was about 40 minutes long. We've obviously taken just a couple of minutes to give you a sense of his call to the American public and, and business leaders. Now I'm honored to introduce our opening speaker who brings an incredible perspective to the topic. He's a recipient of two Purple Hearts during his service in the Vietnam War, was a Senator from Nebraska and served as the Secretary of Defense from 2013 to 2015. He uh, has previously served as a professor at Georgetown and in leadership positions at nonprofits in the, in the corporate sector. And these days, undoubtedly, you've seen him 
uh, in television interviews and commentary, Secretary Chuck Hagel. Secretary Hagel, are you with us? Patrick, uh, I am. Thank you. Uh, I assume you can hear me and see me. So we I, can. I, the, the floor it, is yours. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Patrick. Uh, I followed your instructions meticulously, and um, so I'm uh, unmuted. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you, Patrick, and the uh, National Archives for uh, this opportunity for all of us to learn more about uh, not just Franklin Roosevelt's brilliant speech and a very, very historic time in our country's history and world history, but uh, all the different programs uh, that you offer th through the archives, uh, very important, especially for our younger generation. So thank you and thanks uh, for allowing me the privilege to join all of you. And I wanna thank uh, my fellow panel mates here, uh, Ted and AJ, who uh, we'll hear from shortly, but uh, they add a very important perspective uh, to what we're gonna talk about here this evening. Um, as I was listening to Roosevelt, and uh, I actually went back and, and read Roosevelt's speech uh, last week, um, I thought of uh, my parents. Um, my father uh, was uh, in World War II. He was in the South Pacific for about two and a half years. Uh, during that time, my mother and uh, all of her sisters worked for an armaments manufacturing company in Nebraska. And I think many of you know, the history, history shows that uh, a lot of the armaments were stored in Nebraska. Uh, and in the Midwest uh, during that time, for obvious reasons, it was it was the furthest distance away from both coasts uh, to be invaded by the Japanese or the Germans uh, on the East Coast. And the, so um, I grew up with a, a very clear understanding of Roosevelt, um, of the Depression days, uh, listening to my grandfathers and obviously my parents, but um, specifically, in regard to what we're talking about here uh, this evening, to World War II and the arsenal of democracy and how that all happened and how this country came together uh, to produce historic proportions of uh, armaments, but for a purpose. Uh, and it's the same purpose that uh, Roosevelt noted at the beginning of his speech. And if you read that speech, it's throughout the speech. It's, it's the four freedoms that he talks about. I, uh, after reflecting on this, uh, I thought even more about today. Um, that time, 1940, 41, was obviously a defining time, a very defining time in our history, in the history of mankind. Um, I think we are def defining time, we're at a defining time. Uh, right now in our country and the world, not just because of the global pandemic uh, we're suffering, the entire world uh, is dealing with it, but the consequences that are flowing now from that pandemic and we'll continue to see as we adjust and adapt in the years ahead, but also more than that, the environmental issues uh, that we are seeing in this country uh, throughout the world. The post-World War II world order uh, that we led in building, uh, being challenged at, at every corner, our alliances fraying. Um, it wasn't the world that I was born into uh, and 10 years later started living in and up to now that 75 years post-World War II. This is a different kind of world that is moving in different directions. And it's defining because it's, it's gonna determine how we handle all of this and uh, how we manage all of this. And defining, I think, uh, more than we've ever defined since World War II, what is America's role in the world? Uh, what is our definition of that role? And so I, I see the parallels and the analogies uh, really uh, from 19, 40, 41 to today, obviously a different time 
different circumstances, different dynamics, uh, a lot of different challenges, but still at the same time, it's going to require, just as it required when Franklin Roosevelt spoke to the nation, a public-private partnership, engaging uh, our industry, our businesses, uh, every fiber of our free society and our free trade and our enterprise uh, to come together. All of that very much grounded on our freedoms, uh, freedom, as he talked about, uh, freedom of speech, one of his four freedoms, freedom of religion, uh, uh, freedom from fear uh, of want. Uh, all of that really comes together. And I think it's woven into the same fabric. A 1940-41 fabric is different from a 2020-2021 fabric. We all know that. But our politics is being challenged. Uh, we're as uh, politically polarized as I think we've ever been since World War II. Uh, I served in Vietnam in 1968. That was the worst year in Vietnam. We sent over 16,000 dead Americans home in one year. My brother and I served uh, together. 1968 was a bad year for this country. It was a bad year uh, for America in, in many ways. So uh, polarization is not new in this country, but you encompass all the dynamics that go into that. And, and this is a defining time. And we could, we could learn uh, from Franklin Roosevelt and the and Americans during that time. How did they put the country together? How did they move ahead with all of this? Yes, a war and fighting a war is, is, is different, much different in many ways, but it's the same kind of challenges that we have, the societal challenges. And it really does depend on how we come together, use industry with government. Uh, one of the last things I did as Secretary of Defense and I didn't go back and uh, read uh, Franklin Roosevelt's speech, but it was obvious to me as Secretary of Defense that uh, we needed to bring a, a private public enterprise together uh, much closer than what we had been doing uh, in the Pentagon for national security. Even though over the years, the private sector has made the planes, made the planes and the ships uh, and other armaments and platforms to defend this country. But the innovation, and what comes out of the private sector is so important. And I don't think we've been keeping up with that where it benefits enough the public sector. So I, I initiated a program called Defense Innovation Initiative uh, in my last year as Secretary of Defense to, to really focus on the exact thing, same thing as Franklin Roosevelt talked about in 1940. So um, those are just some thoughts and perspectives uh, that I have when I, I see and hear and read and review what happened during that time, most specifically Franklin Roosevelt's historic arsenal of democracy speech uh, as to how it relates to us as Americans and our future uh, going into the next 50 years. And there's some pretty good examples uh, and some pretty good role models to show how we did it back in those days, not only leadership, but the American people all coming together in a unified way. So I'd be glad to answer questions uh, here later on, but look forward to hearing Ted and AJ. And again, thank you, Patrick, for allowing me a, a chance to share some thoughts. Absolutely. Well, thank you. That's a great way for us to start the program and, and sort of frame the big picture. And uh, as you mentioned, I'm, we're happy and delighted to have you answer some questions a little later on the program. I'm gonna now ask uh, AJ Baim to join us. Um, he is a New York Times bestselling author of The Accidental President, Harry S. Truman, and The Four Months That Changed the World. He also wrote a little book called Arsenal of Democracy a few years back. He's written a number of other popular books as a longtime regular contributor to the Wall Street Journal, as well as other national publications. Welcome, AJ. I know you're gonna help us, give us a little bit of the history and the framing here uh, so I'm going to let you take it over. Welcome. Uh, is everybody hearing me okay? Yep, we can hear you. That's a good start. That's good. So listen, <laughs> uh, I think my job here is just to tell the story of the arsenal of democracy in the, in the small amount of I, I, time I have. Uh, before I start, obviously, thank you, Secretary Hagel, Ted Ryan from Ford Motor Company. I want to say that to me specifically, the work that the National Archives does is, is so, so important and necessary. We're all the better for it. So thank you. Um, 
Now, no, May 29th, 1940, a couple things about that speech. One is um, the largest audience in radio history was tuned in that night. And there's a reason why. Um, I'm gonna read just one sentence from it that I always tease in on because it sort of illuminates a lot. Uh, Roosevelt said on that night, never before since Jamestown and Plymouth Rock has our American civilization been in such danger as now. And the point I'm making here is it's really hard to express, in fact, in any other time, but perhaps today, it would be really hard to express the amount of fear and anxiety that gripped our nation at that time. So FDR gives this speech and he comes up with a plan. He realizes before almost everybody else in America that we were gonna get swept up in this war. It had already begun in Europe and in the Far East. And his idea is to join federal government, military and free enterprise into one unified force. And that is the arsenal of democracy. So um, a little background. Now in 1936, Hitler was in power in, in, in Germany and he created this thing called the four year plan. And what it was, what it seemed to us at the time was during the great depression, an economic stimulus package. Uh, a plan to get uh, Germans back on the workforce. But what it, in fact it was all the way back in 1936 was an effort to prepare for war and to create the first ever fully functional air force. Now, as that is happening here in America uh, in the 1930s, Congress had to pass the neutrality acts. And basically what Congress was trying to do was legislate our country out of foreign wars abroad. Um, we wanted nothing to do with anything else going on. We had too much going on here. And it was also the Great Depression. So obviously there wasn't a lot of money lying around. So our military uh, sort of wasn't doing well. We hadn't invested in our military in years. And FDR realizes that we need to put this military, this arsenal of democracy together with extraordinary speed. And um, the first thing I wanna do, uh, uh, we, can we see the next slide? We should see a slide uh, of a guy named William Knudsen. So, um, there he is. So Bill Knudsen, let me tell a quick story about this guy. He came to this country as a young man with almost no money, no friends, um, not much hope. And by 1940, he had become the president of General Motors. So he was the high paid executive in America outside of Hollywood. And FDR decides to make him what he called production czar. And so he has Knudsen come down to the White House and offers this man who had the highest paid salary of anyone in America outside of Hollywood, a job for the federal government for $1. And Newton takes the job and he goes home and explains to his family, he says, quote, this country has been very good to me and I wanna pay it back. And Newton was chosen very carefully for two reasons. One is he was a production miracle maker at General Motors, the largest company of any kind in the world. But also he was uh, this figure in the automobile industry because key to this arsenal of democracy was going to be the American automobile industry. So that is the focal point of mass production in our country, uh, where it all came from, where it was happening. And at the time, uh, the American automobile industry had a larger economy than any nation on earth, except for Germany, the United Kingdom, France, and possibly the Soviet Union. So Knudsen does something amazing. He goes to the New York Auto Show and he's he, where he can collect all those automobile executives, the people who held, you know, who are driving this big machine all in one place and he makes a speech. And I'm gonna read you a tiny little piece of it right now. This is what he says. And this is a quote, 50,000 airplanes, 130,000 engines, 17,000 heavy guns, 25,000 light guns, 13,000 trench mortars. And he goes on and on. And he sums it up by saying, gentlemen, the first half of 1941 is crucial, quote, we must outbuild Hitler. So he begins this plan and, uh, you know, basically what happened in Detroit is it became the biggest boom town uh, of the war. And there's a reason why we still refer to Detroit today as the arsenal of democracy. Um, it's important to remember during 1942 and 1943, everything went wrong before it went right. And that's what people I think really don't understand about the arsenal of democracy. They think, well, we flipped a switch and we fixed the problem. It took years. And uh, in this book, The Arsenal of Democracy, um, I chose to really focus in on the Ford family for two reasons, excuse me. Uh, one is because 
uh, the story of the Fords during World War II really helps to illuminate really the best way of illuminating all that was going on here on the home front during the war, but also it's just an extraordinary human story. So um, if we look at the next slide, what you'll see is Edsel Ford. Now Edsel Ford is Henry Ford, his uh, only, only son. Um, and Edsel is, um, at the beginning of the war, Edsel had been president of Ford Motor Company for many, many years. His real love was aviation. And he wanted to be an aviation pioneer, but that dream was taken away from him for a variety of reasons that I don't have to, time to explain. But he's also at the beginning of the war very ill and he's dying, he finds out he's dying of cancer. And he comes up with this idea to create, he wants to take the biggest bomber, bomber in existence at the time, the B-24, and make it the most mass produced American military aircraft of all time. And in fact, it still is the most mass produced American military aircraft of all time. So they come up with this idea to build a factory, uh, the largest airplane factory in the world, and to build these 60,000 bombers, 60,000 pound bombers at a rate of one per hour. And nothing like this had ever happened. They had to solve amazing numbers of problems, but in fact, it worked. And if you think about it, if you were to sum up, perhaps Secretary Hagel can tell me I'm wrong about this, but if you were to sum up what our military strategy was at the time in the most basic language, it was this. If we could send fleets and fleets and fleets of bombers over Germany, a lot of them would get shot down. If behind those, there were more fleets and fleets and fleets of bombers, some of them would get shot, and then the next fleet, and then the next fleet. If we had so many bombers that we could render the opposition, the enemy, defenseless, and then send in our ground troops, which is exactly what we did on D-Day, we would win. And that was the strategy. Um, uh, but Willow Run, the Ford factory, is really just one example of all that Detroit did at the time. So if you have to imagine, Chrysler built uh, the Detroit tank arsenal, one factory that built as many tanks as all of Nazi Germany during the war, one factory. And Chrysler had never built tanks before. Cadillac, imagine beautiful Cadillac cars in 1940. By the end of the war, Cadillac was producing a tremendous number of tanks, Cadillac tanks, never happened before. Uh, Old, Oldsmobile bullets, Pontiac guns. Uh, and really, if you sum it up, that's how we won the war. Now, um, I wanna share with you one more thought. I really don't even know how long I've been talking. I hope it's not too long or too short. But listen, on December 9th, 1941, so two days after Pearl Harbor, FDR gave another speech. Oh, by the way, we can flip the slide. Just really quickly, here you see Edsel Ford and the man on the, uh, on the right of your screen is cast iron Charlie Sorensen, fascinating character. Another guy who came to America with almost nothing. And he was really the chief engineer of Ford Motor Company. He was the brains of the factories, um, an incredible man. Now, uh, back to what I was saying, I think we can just go through the, uh, yeah, you can just look at some more pictures. That's the Willow Run bomber plant, another shot of it. But the point I wanna make as I'm finishing up here, two days after Pearl Harbor, FDR gave a speech and he said something so extraordinarily poignant to me. Uh, he said, um, every single man, woman and child is a partner in the most tremendous undertaking of our American history. And I think the most important point about the arsenal of democracy is the amount of sacrifice, hundreds of thousands, millions of soldiers joined the military, went overseas, over 400,000 didn't come back. But if you think about it, how many small businesses closed? How many families had to pick up roots and moved to a faraway place they had never been? How many families woke up and was frustrated that there was no sugar for coffee and no beer in the refrigerator? How many women joined the workforce? Rosie the Riveter, of course. Uh, how, how amazing it was and difficult um, for us to integrate black and white together on assembly lines. You know, Detroit, the Detroit uh, race riot of 1943 was a horrifying, horrifying event for our country. But the idea is black and white, man and woman, all of America came together and that's the only way we were gonna win. And that's really the essence of the arsenal of democracy. So that's my chat. I thank you very much. I hope it was useful. Thank you. AJ, that was great. Thank you. And I'm sure there'll be lots of questions for you. Uh, during the Q&A, because we do have some history buffs here. Our last guest uh, is Ted Ryan. He's the Heritage Brand Manager at Ford Archives for Ford Motor Company. He has been there for three years. Before that, Ted was the Archives Director for the Coca-Cola Company for 21 years, and I discovered in my research he may have had the best 
a newspaper headline when he changed jobs. Coca-Cola historian drives off to new job at Ford Motor. Love that. Uh, he had a number of roles before that, the Atlanta History Center and the Bobby Jones Collection. And he's the past chairman of the Business Archive Section of the Society of American Archivists. Ted, I know you've got some uh, great stuff to show us uh, from the Ford perspective, so I'm going to let you jump in. I do, but I got a bone to pick. You put me following Secretary Hagel and AJ. That's a hard act to follow. I do have to follow. So, but thank you so much for having me on. And I did want to talk uh, briefly about uh, the role of Ford Motor Company. AJ set it up brilliantly with with the discussion on Willow Run. And if you can go ahead and start showing that that first video uh, that we've got teed up, I just wanted a few more highlights on on Willow Run itself. And as he mentioned to me, AJ is, I'm not sorry, not AJ, um, Edsel Ford. Well, let me take a second. Uh, the Ford Motor Company donated all of its early film holdings. And at one point we were the largest movie production studio in the world to the National Archives. Uh, so Patrick and I have had conversations on a number of different uh, fronts about, uh, they have a great digitization project. And then if anybody's uh, interested in, in doing more research, go to the National Archives site and look for the Ford Motor Company film collection. And you can watch this and other arsenal of democracy type films. So, but as, as AJ laid it out to me, Edsel Ford is the true hero of the Ford Motor Company. He was ill. He doesn't get the credit he deserves. He was the backbone of Ford Motor Company and his vision on Willow Run and the, the genius of Charlie Sorensen and building it just to build the plant alone, guys, was 7,500,000 man hours. Uh, each individual plane, uh, uh, to, had 6,439 individual parts held together by 78,606 rivets and 1,000 uh, bolts, and it weighed approximately two and a quarter tons. The assembly line itself was a mile and a half long. And as you can see from some of the video, we actually had to do other things. We had to build the infrastructure around Willow Run in order to, uh, to get the plant up and going. Uh, from there, you can go ahead and kill the, the, that, that video for now. Uh, the Willow Run was, was a true uh, engineering marvel to produce a bomber in an hour. And uh, it's a testament to Edsel Ford's vision. Unfortunately for, uh, for Ford Motor Company and for the world, Edsel didn't live to see it through. Uh, he passed away before, uh, before the uh, war ended. Next, I'm going to tell a more, probably more surprising story from Ford Motor Company history, because what you see in front of you is a Jeep coming off an assembly line at Highland Park. Uh, uh, plant here in Detroit. Uh, if you can go ahead and start rolling the video. Uh, I'm going to tell the backstory on the Jeep. Most people don't know it, but the Army was looking for uh, an Army reconnaissance vehicle, one called the Jeep initially. And uh, Ford was one of the three different companies that uh, submitted plans for the Jeep. Uh, Ford, uh, Willis Overland, and Bantam were the three that were creating the reconnaissance cars to join the Army. Uh, the famous uh, vertical grille pattern uh, that you see on the on the front of the Jeep was actually created by Ford engineers. We were uh, figured out how to stamp it like that. Willis Overland's version had some uh, metal bars that were welded to the beginning of the of the Jeep assembly. So Ford essentially de designed the outside of the Jeep. Uh, Willis Overland designed uh, the excellent engine and drivetrain. Ford had tried to tr put a tractor engine in it, it just would not work. Uh, and Bantam which, which was the initial party that had been contacted by the Army, uh, did contribute some of the features as well. Uh, Ford actually, there's uh, Edsel Ford again. Uh, Ford actually created and built more than 282,000 of these Jeeps during World War II uh, as part of our efforts for the armed services. And with that, you can go ahead and, and stop running this, uh, this video. Uh, it, it, I'm constantly surprised. I'm wearing my Bronco logo, uh, the, but the Bronco was born out of the Jeep and, and how few people know that Ford played such a critical role in the creation and the development of the Jeep. But we did more than build airplanes. We did more than build Jeeps. If you think about the industrial might of the Ford Motor Company, we spanned across America. We had plants everywhere. Uh, we were building generators in Los Angeles. We were building uh, uh, engines here, the Lincoln plant that was churning out Lincoln Continentals up until 1940, uh, turned around and began producing airplane engine motors for, uh, under Pritt Watney. Uh, we uh, were building trucks, ambulances, just about anything that you can think of, the M10, the M4, uh, a lot, bunch of different tank uh, varieties. 
And then one of the surprising ones, uh, gliders. Uh, I know AJ knows the story because he wrote the book, but Ford uh, designed and built a series of, of gliders that were used by the armed forces. Uh, but we were just one of the big three. And I always want to make sure that we give credit to the other automobile manufacturers. And AJ laid out some of the different things that the different uh, auto uh, makers were doing. Everybody pulled together in order to, to meet the wartime crunch. And it wasn't just flipping a switch. In 1942, it was horrible. And if you had been at Willow Run at early 1943, I don't think you would have had a pleasant time there either. Uh, and it took a while to get the, the war machinery up and going. And AJ mentioned Rosie the Riveter. Rosie the Riveter was an actual person in a uh, woman from Kentucky named Rosie who came to work at Willow Run uh, and was seen by some of the, the PR agents for the, for the War Department. And then uh, the legend of Rosie the Riveter was born. Uh, and, and Ford is excited to have played a troll uh, during World War II uh, for the different wartime production elements. And with that, Patrick, let me throw it back over to you. Terrific, thank you. And um, uh, you know, one thing I, I'll invite uh, Secretary Hagel and AJ to turn your mics and cameras back on while we get to start to get the Q and A. So I want to remind folks that we are going to take Q and A. So we want to uh, encourage you to use the chat box in YouTube, and uh, want to welcome folks. Uh, not shockingly, we've got some folks from Detroit uh, uh, watching, uh, Riverview, Florida, Chicago, uh, Arlington, White Bear, Minnesota. Uh, Atlanta, Connecticut, New York City, Tallahassee, Silver Spring. Uh, so we've got, uh, we've got a great range of folks. So please put your, your questions in. I do have a, a couple of follow-ups here. It's the, uh, the opportunity of the moderator to, to take this liberty. Um, but uh, Ted, now I mentioned this in the beginning, obviously there was lots of news at the beginning of the, the COVID crisis. Um, the government was asking different businesses to ramp up manufacturing on a variety of needs around the healthcare thing. One, I know Ford's got a great story around this. Why don't you uh, share that story? I will, uh, Ford, uh, very quickly in the early days of the pandemic, developed what they call Project Apollo based on the movie Apollo 13 and the Apollo 13 story where you had to, to build things based on and solve problems based on what you had available. And a cross-border team, half of them in Canada at the Windsor, Windsor Ontario plant, and some in Detroit, designed and built, uh, we've now built more than 50,000 respirators. I'm very excited. This one just came to the archives. I shared this picture with Patrick earlier this week. This is respirator VIN number one, a serial number one. And it was built out of existing car parts. And our engineers figured out how to solve a problem and how to fill a need. And we also built face shields, we built masks, we built uh, any number of different things and we're continuing to do it. We're, we're uh, pledged to donate 100 million uh, masks around the world. So it's just one piece. And, and to me, I, when I described it to Patrick, it's the arsenal of medicine that we're, that we're working for now. And once again, we're gonna put our engineering and our know-how, and if we can develop a willow run, we can develop a way to build respirators. So thank you for letting me tell that story, Patrick. Absolutely. Um, Secretary Hagel, um, you touched on this at the end of your, your remarks. You know, Eisenhower famously warned the public in his farewell address about the military industrial complex. Um, in your, you, you started to talk a little bit at the end about your experience at the Pentagon and the private sector. Is this something we should still be worried about or do you think it's just a different mentality now? Well, um, I think we should always, uh, be alert to um, one sector uh, overpowering another another sector uh, in our country. And uh, I've read that speech of Eisenhower's many times, and um, I have used it as a very instructive speech because in that speech, as you know, I know our I know AJ, uh, no, I'm sure Ted does too. And many of the people on on here with us tonight know that that speech was more than just about the, the military industrial complex. It, it was one of the best speeches I think Eisenhower ever gave, and I think one of the best presidential speeches ever given. But there was a message in that, and uh, when, you, when you get out of balance, where, where the defense industry, the private sector, what he was concerned about, what he was talking about, then controls uh, policymaking, and strategy, then, then that, that you've gone too far. I, I think in some ways we've gone back and forth, we've swayed back and forth 
uh, not listen enough to private sector and to the innovations of the private sector and balancing that. So um, I think it was a good uh, a warning and I think it was, it was a good flag to plant for future generations and for future uh, policymakers. Right. Uh, and AJ, um, you talked about Detroit, but obviously this was impacting, as we hear from the, the fireside chat, he mentions all these different kinds of businesses that were being called on to take action. Um, in your work on the book, did you come across other, other uh, communities, cities, uh, industrial hubs that um, also were a part of this? I mean, Detroit's very iconic uh, to this, but well, let me start. I can answer the question with a number. So Detroit at the time was the fourth largest city in the, in the country and made just a little under a third of the military material during the war. That leaves a lot of other stuff. So, um, you know, San Diego was a big hub. Uh, New York, New Jersey, Chicago, uh, New Orleans was a big hub, Portland, Oregon. Um, what I think a point that I can make here, though, is just the whole idea of the fact that everybody and all communities participated. And this, I have this image in my mind, I remember reading what, during my research, um, how thrilling it was for people reading about it in diaries, people who lived in small towns where we're talking about many years of depression, remember, where you know industry was not doing well, where suddenly in 1941, in these small towns, you have people writing in their diary about how shocked they were to see smoke coming out of the smoke stack in the factory in their town, something they hadn't seen in years. And that happened everywhere in America. Okay. And I don't know if this is for you or maybe Ted can answer this. Uh, one of our questions from our audience is, how did the firms decide who would produce which war goods? Was this something Sorensen in that sort of meeting you described that, that got mapped out or and how was that determined? Go ahead, Ted. I'll start it. Uh, that was War Production Board. It was not the individual companies. Individual companies uh, solicited for different areas of work, but it was the War Production Board that was deciding you should build this, you should build this. And, and uh, Knunston, I always have a hard time with his name, was the behind that knowing who had the particular genius in the different areas. Chrysler had uh, particular aptitude in one area, and Edsel was begging along with Sorensen for the ability to build the planes. Uh, but at the same time, we're also doing the Jeeps, and we're doing the this and that. But the War Production Board ultimately was making the final decision. Just one okay. thing to add to that. I think yeah. one of the things I was very surprised to find in the Ford archives, as a matter of fact, um, correspondence from Edsel Ford, how, how important Edsel thought it was that all of this war work didn't just go to the big companies, that small companies got a piece of that. That was, which is really extraordinary if you think about it. But another important thing is to just address the economics of it. It's, um, you know, people, if you think about it, all of this costs a lot of money. Where did it come from? And essentially we were printing, printing money and read your John Maynard Keynes. Uh, but really it's, I think it's important to point out how these contracts were structured. They were just something called cost plus. So everything was done at 8% above. So companies had to make profits, 8% on all their contracts, what it would cost them to build, say, a bomber. There was an 8% profit built in there. Uh, and it wasn't that they were profiting off of war. What it was was, I think, econom econ economists understood how democracy and how free enterprise worked. And it was important for these companies to be earning some money or they wouldn't survive. They wouldn't be able to pay their stockholders, et cetera, et cetera. OK. Uh, here's one that's probably uh, more for Secretary Hagel. Um, asking a question about uh, contractors these days for, for the military um, are, are not, I guess, not regularly audited. Is this something that you think could be pursued as a way to draw out um, uh, these sort of innovative ideas you, you were saying, or uh, is this a political sort of slide that no one would really ever touch? Uh, you want me to answer? Sure, sure. I do. Uh, well, it's not, not quite accurate to say that uh, these contracts uh, are not reviewed. Uh, these contracts are, are uh, very carefully uh, re reviewed at many, many steps. In fact, there's been criticism over the years that there's too much review. Also, there's the option of, uh, of one uh, company not getting the, the bid or two or three others that were finalists, and, and they can stop the, the contract from going forward and they have uh, the options of going to court. So there, 
they have a lot of options uh, out there so that nothing gets ramrodded through that doesn't get appropriate reviews. I, th I think there are uh, a number and, and I think more than adequate reviews of contracts, uh, not just uh, by the, the immediate contracting officials, whether it's an Air Force platform or Navy or Army, uh, whatever it is, but, but also uh, uh, other uh, contracting view, review experts within the Pentagon, within defense itself. Uh, can, you, can we do better? I think you can always do better, but um, I think the American citizens should be assured that uh, there are mechanisms and review sections in place and processes in place to assure that we're getting the best product uh, uh, for the best price and the follow through. Now, there, there have been examples over the years that uh, so many of these big projects like the F-35, for example, uh, have, have uh, gone on and on and they're over budget, way over budget, but, but they're in the middle of everything. And then it's almost impossible to stop it in the middle of production to start all over because you've already invested billions of dollars. So it's imperfect. I know that. And uh, we can do better. And I think we've made a lot of mistakes in the past. But uh, the Congress uh, plays a very important role here. The Congress has an oversight role that uh, uh, I, I think uh, re really is the most important factor here. In it. And they take their responsibilities uh, very seriously. I've been on both sides of that issue, being a member of the Senate and then being the executive. And I, I understand both and we need both. Very helpful. Um, I think, Ted, these might be, I got two here for you. Um, uh, so when a company like Ford developed new technology as part of this effort, was the company allowed to patent it or um, what happened? And then a follow-up question, did anyone in the Ford family serve in the military? Uh, yes, Henry, I'll, I'll answer the second one first. Uh, Henry Ford II was in the Navy and was called out of uh, naval duty back to Ford Motor Company at the beginning to the government when Edsel passed away and, and Henry Sr. Was, uh, uh, was growing incre increasingly incapable of uh, operating the company. So uh, Henry Ford II was in the Navy and what was called back out. I think Vincent was too, but I'm, I'm not 1,000% certain on that one. Uh, what happens with, on the new technologies? It, it, it all depends. Uh, like the Jeep itself, uh, the three companies contributed to the design and none of those three companies retained the designs at the end. It's, it's ironic to me because a stamp, you know, the, the drawings are stamped on Ford engineering blueprint paper that went to the different companies, but uh, Willis also provided the engine. So at the, after the end of the war, uh, Willis Overland purchased the trademark to the Jeep and was able to, to begin to produce the Jeeps. And Secretary Hagel made no more on new technologies that are developed uh, for military contracts. But uh, I know from the past examples, well, we didn't want to keep building tanks anyway, so <laughs> we gave it back. And AJ will know, ironically, Willow Run was later given back to the United States government and was then sold to GM, which operated Willow Run as, as a GM plant for a period of time. Uh, so the war was transitory and, and the work that happened was transitory as well. Secretary Hagel, did you want to put a modern spin to that with regard to innovation? No, or, uh, yeah, okay. no, I don't have anything to add, but. Okay. Um, so, um, Lost track here. Uh, you mentioned Willow Run. Um, can you explain? I have a couple questions about uh, the unique layout. You've talked about it's obviously the scale of it, um, but could you give us a little bit more detail on that? AJ, could you take this one? Well, I can. <laughs> start it. Yeah, there's a fascinating story about it. It's fascinating. So Henry Ford was a Republican, and FDR was not. And so uh, this massive factory. It was so big. It was the largest airplane factory in the world and it was the largest factory of any kind under one roof. Uh, it was so large that when it was originally designed, it went over the county line. So it went, uh, Ted, to tell me if I got this wrong, the factory moved from, was originally laid out to move from a Republican held county into a town that had voted Democrat. And so FDR did not want this to happen. So the whole thing was built in the shape of an L. And what's fascinating about this is that in 1943, FDR takes this cross-country trip on a train to see the arsenal of democracy. And he gets, and he, FDR and Henry Ford hated each other. I mean, they hated each other. 
And so uh, FDR gets to Willow Run, he wants to see it, and he's put in a, a car with Henry Ford to tour the factory. And they get to the point in the factory where it hooks a left turn and FDR says, ah, here's the county line. <laughs> so <laughs> that's just one story. Ed, why don't you take, take it from there? Well, no, the, and, and the intricacy of the plant, it was, it was a monstrous, as AG described, it was so big to build it. It was, and uh, frankly, I don't know anybody besides a Charlie Sorensen could have, with Edsel's support, figured out how to build it. Uh, but the L shape, it was, always amuses me. But uh, I, I'll, I'll characterize it more, but with an Edsel story and a human interest story, because Edsel was there when uh, President Roosevelt came, and Edsel was the shining star of Willow Run and, and the driving force behind it, uh, and brought Henry kind of dragging and kicking into the concept of Willow Run being built. But it was so it's Edsel's vision and that he was there when FDR toured. It was a great story. You can go, we could spend an hour talking about the different derivatives. I mean, the number of dies. I mean, if you build a die for a car, something that stamps a hood in a particular shape, you can run that, that die for months and you can build enough, you know, that you might need for, for three months. You can run a die uh, for two days in a, an airplane factory and you build all you needed for the next two months. So we built 8,000 dies almost every other week to, to keep the parts flowing uh, to, con to, to build those planes. It was an engineering marvel. And the beauty of the assembly line isn't that the thing goes down the line, it's that the right parts get there at the right time as it's going down the line to, to end up with a completed unit. It was an engineering marvel. I'd love to see a, a documentary done on the construction of Willow Run because it, it'd be fascinating viewing. Perfect. Um, AJ, this I think is uh, for you. Uh, could you expand on Don Nelson's role, whether the government's efforts to the Marshall, uh, Marshall industry were mixed in their effectiveness? Can you repeat the question, please? Sure. Can you expand on uh, Dan Nelson's role and whether the government's efforts to Marshall industry were mixed in its effectiveness? Okay, so Donald Nelson was uh, head of the War Production Board, and he was another guy who came in from private industry. I think he was also another a dollar a year man uh, who came to work for the government for, for a buck. And, um, you know, I'm going back because I did this research seven, eight years ago. Um, but uh, Donald Nelson, I think he got tangled up in a lot of uh, internal politics, if I remember correctly. And I, I, I'm sorry if this is wrong. I think he was from Sears Roebuck. Somebody fact check that for me, please. But um, uh, my favorite thing about Donald Nelson really is that he wrote um, a book ab about his experience in World War II and it really lays bare everything that, you know, how so much went wrong. Because if you have, if you imagine the monumental effort of what had to occur to change from war peacetime to wartime economy, just a lot went wrong and he was there for it. Um, so he was there for the, for when things were not going right. And, you know, it's important most people who, who haven't studied any, war, uh, any history of the war don't realize the degree to which we were losing it in 1942. Uh, and a lot of that had to do with what was going, you know, how everything was taking so long to, um, you know, to come to fruition. For example, Willow Run, uh, the Truman Committee, Harry Truman, who was a very obscure Senator at the time comes to Willow Run to do an investigation a little bit in 1942, a little bit in 1943 to find out why isn't, this working. I thought we were going to have bombers. Of course, the, the, the adventure, the engineering adventure was very successful in the end, but it was really hard to do. And I think Donald Nelson was a guy who took a lot of credit for what went right and a lot of credit for what went wrong. So I hope that that answers the question. Terrific. Thank you. I don't know if this might be you or Ted. What about um, the role of Hollywood? Obviously, you have the films. So Ford was producing uh, its own films, but uh, can you can either of you talk to the the role Hollywood played to promote the propaganda machine about the arsenal of democracy in the war effort? Ted, I can do it in general. I, I can speak more precisely about Ford because we did Ford Motor Company for a period of time had the largest film production studio in the world. By the by, the World War II we didn't have the biggest, but we we're still pretty big. But we were producing these films as morale boosters on the home front for educational purposes to be shown in schools. Uh, they weren't really promotional tools to promote Ford per se, as they were to educate people as to what was going on. Uh, imagine it's your news of the world uh, being shown before a primary feature. 
for my Coke days, I know the role that, that Hollywood played just in general from World War II in the production of the spectaculars and uh, uh, the different war bond drives of uh, Coca-Cola had the, uh, oh golly, I've been away for years and I forgot the name of the, the Victory Parade to Spotlight Bands. And, and there were any number of different companies that were doing this, trying to sell the war bonds and Hollywood obviously is doing its part as well to try to contribute and to, to boost the morale during the early days and sell war bonds in the later days. Yeah, that's, that's helpful context. Um, we're getting close to uh, wrapping up here, but um, we'd have a follow-up question. There was a mention of FDR's relationship with Etzel Ford. Was this just a political, um, uh, a political issue? Was there more to that, that, that conflict that they didn't get along? To put let, me just, let me answer that because this is what happened. Uh, Henry and Etzel Ford had, were father-son and they had a very difficult relationship. Henry Ford thought that FDR was just the worst thing that had ever happened to America. And the reason why is when FDR comes into office, he has this famous hundred uh, days, first hundred days, the company is crippled, I mean, the whole nation is crippled by the depression and the federal government came up with all sorts of ideas to try to regulate industry, to put our economy on us just on a sound, to stabilize it. And, F, and Henry Ford thought that there was absolutely, and a lot of people will, this is very much, this kind of thing is very much a conversation today. Um, Henry Ford thought that uh, the president of the United States should not have anything to do with how any industrialist like himself ran his company. Now, Edsel Ford and Henry Ford were very often at odds. And fascinatingly, you know, Henry hated FDR and refused to meet with them. And when they finally met six years into FDR's uh, administration that, that it made the cover of Time magazine. They were both on there with a lightning bolt in between because the whole nation was fascinated by how much these guys hated each other. But Etzel Ford was a big fan of FDR. And Etzel Ford, it just illustrates how the father and the son didn't always get along. Etzel Ford uh, um, ran a huge charity drive for polio victims. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Contributed to the of Warm Springs. He, he did so much. Etzel Ford was a true. Uh, gallant gentleman and uh, was more along the lines of, of uh, what we would have wanted the Ford Motor Company to act like every single day. And thank goodness, eventually we did. Um, Secretary Hagel, I think I've got a great closing question for us. Uh, as you look back on your years uh, of experience as a legislator, cabinet executive, what's the biggest lesson from the 40s that we should apply to in the 2020s? Well, I think uh, there are a lot of lessons we've learned, but, but one is uh, we don't live for today. Uh, we live for tomorrow. Uh, today's gone and we can't influence it, but, but we can for tomorrow. And I think uh, for leaders, and I mean private sector, public sector, I don't mean political leaders, everybody, uh, that lesson is learned over and over in, in history, unfortunately. And there's a some pretty difficult lessons that we've learned throughout history on that, on that point. Uh, second point, I think, is uh, uh, you bring all people into an effort. Uh, that means you listen. You respect everybody's opinion. And I think that's what FDR did with that speech we're talking about tonight. It, it, when he talked about bringing the country together, together to unify it for a purpose. Uh, I think the third thing, it, but it really fits into the first two, is uh, you have to have a purpose. And um, it's always important for that purpose. And uh, whatever you're gonna do, it, it's gotta be governed by a purpose worthy uh, of free people and people who believe in values for mankind. So, I mean, we could go on for a long time about what did we learn uh, that we could apply to today and still learning. But I, in my opinion, those are maybe three of the the more important lessons that we have been taught from history and history is so, so important. Well, thank you. That was a terrific way to close our, our conversation. I wanna thank you, Secretary Hagel, AJ, Ted. Uh, this has really been wonderful, wonderful. I appreciate your time and your insights. And uh, indeed uh, we are big promoters of history. So uh, this, the, the context of the conversation has been wonderful for from the archive side of things. So. Uh, with that, I just have a few closing remarks. I want to thank you. I know you all are, are signing off. 
Um, and uh, just a few announcements here. We really appreciate all of our members and corporate supporters, our donors who are with us. Um, we really uh, you know, can't do it without you. And if you're not a member of the foundation, you can join today by visiting archivesfoundation.org. We also invite you to go to nationalarchivesstore.org. I'm sure you hear those sleigh bells coming, warming up your credit card for Black Friday or Cyber Monday. Please include the archive store in your list of virtual shopping trips this season. You can see two of AJ's uh, books there. Um, and as you know, we've got uh, one of the, the best, I'm sorry, the best gift shop in DC, and I would argue online. So I hope you'll come and visit us and help support the foundation and, and our work to support the archives. We've got some terrific programs coming up on October 29th, next week. We're bringing back the guru of chocolate history, Dave Borgasani from Mars, American Heritage Chocolate to talk about chocolate history in the military. I guarantee you this will be a tasty program. In November, we are going to continue our presidential library series talking to directors of the Eisenhower Library on November 5th and the George W. Bush Library on November 18th. To keep up with our programs and our other activities, uh, you can follow us obviously on social media. Remember what is past this prologue and until next time, thank you from the National Archives Foundation for joining us today.